All right, guys, so in this video, we're going to talk about the pancreas, and there's some key elements that you're definitely going to have to know for step one. And so we cover that, and there's a couple, I think, some really good questions. I think it's almost to the level of a, of a step exam uh, for these. So I'm kind of excited about that. And so try to answer the question before I actually explain it. I know I go kind of fast just for the sake of the video. But see if you can answer the questions. You know, hit pause. See if you can answer it before I actually get to it myself. So hope this is helpful, um, and we'll see you next video. All right, guys. So the first question reads, a... Uh a 39-year-old male with unknown past medical history is admitted for severe abdominal pain. The patient is disheveled and is, and is known to community EMS, emergency medical services, as being uh, homeless. Laparotomy reveals swollen and necrotic pancreas. There's three questions to this. Uh, so the first one says, which of the following lab findings would be suggestive of the patient's condition? So <clears throat> when, you, when you look at this, you, you know, you got to go with the clues that they give you, um, and you make some kind of inference, inferences here. Guy's homeless, and he has, uh, you know, uh, a necrotic pancreas, and he's got abdominal pain. So chances are the diagnosis, as we're going to say, is pancreatitis. Okay? That's going to be pancreatitis. So then we have to make another kind of an assumption here of, well, you know, the guy's living on the street, he's got pancreatitis, um, and so and, and they might give you more clues, but we also have to suspect that there, that alcohol might be playing a factor into this, okay? So with that, we would say, which of the following lab findings would be most suggestive of the patient's condition? So we have diagnosis of pancreatitis and that alcoholism. Is it GGT uh, of eight? And of course, they, they might not give you this on the exam. You might have to look, kind of look it up. There's always a lab value box on the top right on your actual exam. But is it GGT of eight? Is it an AST to ALT ratio of less than one? Is it C, an MCV of 102? Is it D, an elevated MCHC? Or is it E, microcytosis? So you have to know with alcohol, if, if this guy had alcohol, and even though it says pancreas and alcohol, you might have some liver issues, actually the GGT in that situation would be more elevated, okay? Now, the GGT, we can say that can diagnose liver disease, okay? Um, but it can't determine which, what, what cause, okay? It could also be damage to the bile ducts and, and, and stuff. But for the most part, we always think GGT, if someone is like a chronic... Um, chronic alcoholic and it has liver, uh, liver damage, liver disease. But in this situation, it's decreased, so it's not going to be A. An AST to ALT ratio of less than 1? Well, remember the AST to ALT ratio of less than 1, that means the number on bottom would be much bigger, right? And let's just say, say this number was 100. Of it to be less than 1, that means the AST would have to be a lot, um, you know, it has to be less than the bottom number. But we know if everything else was equal, that if someone who's an alcoholic, it's the AST would be elevated, right? The AST would be elevated in someone with alcoholism. So in theory, it would be an AST to ALT ratio more so that would be greater than one. Now that doesn't always hold for everything because you know there could be a situation where the person has, say, you know, hepatitis or there's some liver inflammation. So that ratio can kind of get uh, doesn't always hold true. But in this situation, for alcoholism, you're looking for a, a greater AST to ALT ratio per se. Um, doesn't always hold to be true, but it, but it would not be, in theory, uh, less than one if I'm looking for straight up alcoholism, okay? Um, anyways, the learning point on that one is AST is for alcoholism more so than the ALT. So is it an MCV of, greater, of 102? Now here, the normal is between 80 and 99, so 102 means like a big cell, right? MCV is kind of like the, the, the size. Um, so that's a possibility, because what do we say? When an MCV is greater than 100, okay, you, you either think B12 deficiency or folate, okay? And you can see that with alcoholism. Is there an elevated MCHC? Well, what, when do you see MCHC elevated? Really, the one that we, for step one, it's the hereditary spherocytosis, okay? 
So it's definitely not that one. We have nothing in here that's going to be talking about that. We, there's no blood smear. There's no nothing to really um, that would have led us in that direction. Uh, anyways, hereditary, hereditary spherocytosis um, or lab work. Now, is it E, microcytosis? Well, we just said one, an MCV of 102. This is, you know, if this is normal size, this is macrocytosis, large cell. And then this would be the micro, a little bit, you know, obviously smaller than the normal. So it's, so if the alcoholism is associated with the MCV being elevated, it wouldn't be a microcytosis. It should have been a macrocytosis. So that one's off the table. So the correct answer is going to be an MCV of 102 because that would lead us to a B12 or a folate deficiency. And that's where we would have, you know, with uh, alcoholism associated with this guy. The second, the second question says, activation of which of the following enzymes is most responsible for the patient's condition? And this is the big kind of a, the learning point per se from, for this video is we have to understand the pancreas, okay? We got to understand the basics of the pancreas. And again, you're trying to tell a story. You start at the mouth and, 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 and you know, work your way down. So we are at the pancreas. Now the pancreas is essentially gonna think of the three, there's three things it's gonna do, okay? It's gonna help with the digestion of, of carbs, lipids, okay, and proteins. Carbs, lipids, proteins. And when, and when it's like expecting food to come down the pipe, uh, you know, it, it ten, it'll, it'll start to activate these guys. But more specifically, when we're talking about these, how it digests the proteins, they call it activation of the brush border enzymes, okay? But for the step one, you're going to need to know enterokinase or enteropeptidase, okay? Enteropeptidase. Because these guys, activation of the brush border enzymes, enterokinase, enteropeptidase, they activate trypsinogen, okay? Trypsinogen, when it has ogen, ogen means to make. It's gonna make, so it activates trypsinogen. Now, trypsinogen itself, as we mentioned, is inactive. But it makes, obviously, to make trypsin. Now, trypsin is active, okay? And it's gonna get, it's gonna kickstart these guys. It's gonna kickstart the digestion for the proteins, which are gonna be the, well, we're just gonna write this one one more time, trypsinogen to trypsin, okay? Because they're gonna call this a feedback loop, right? It's kinda like it's gonna go back and do the same thing back and forth. Then we have chymotrypsinogen. Now if it's trypsinogen, it's to make, chymotrypsin, um, chymotrypsin. And then we got this proelastase, elastase, you know, pro being four, um, and then elastase, okay? So you gotta make these guys are the digestive enzymes for the proteins, right? Because again, the pancreas is gonna make what? It's gonna digest carbs, lipids, and proteins. And this the protein ones where they can ask a lot of these questions because, again, activates the brush border enzymes, enterokinase, enteropeptidase, activate trypsinogen, which makes activates makes trypsin. And this is the guy that's going to kickstart this feedback loop, chymotrypsin. It's going to make chymotrypsin through chymotrypsinogen, and then elastase. Okay. And now for the carbs and lipids, they're pretty easy, right? Carbs the pancreas is gonna give us amylase. For the lipids, it's gonna give us the lipase, okay? Um, and these are active forms, okay? Active forms. And then there's also this phospholipase A2, kind of a second player, and he's inactive. But anyways, this is the story you have to know. This is the story you gotta tell, okay? is that when you're making your way, you get past the stomach, now you're at the pancreas, you gotta say, oh, well, I know, how, I know what the pancreas does. It's gonna help us with the digestion of carbs, lipids, and proteins. Well, how does it do that? Oh, with carbs, it, makes, it gives us amylase to do that. With lipids, it gives us lipase to do that. 
and phospholipase A2. For proteins, oh, it's a little more complicated. We gotta get the activation of the brush border enzymes, enterokinase and enteropeptidase, to give us trypsinogen to make trypsin, which will activate the uh, proteases, as they say. And so that's, that's gonna give us a trypsinogen to trypsin, feedback loop, chymotrypsinogen, and proelastase. Okay, and that'll give us these guys, which are gonna help digest the proteins. So, now that you know that story, you have to go back and say, well, with activation of which of the following enzymes is most responsible for the patient's condition? Remember, this guy's got pancreatitis. So, is it gonna be amylase? Is that gonna be the one that's gonna, uh, you know, kinda dissolve or have to make a necrotic pancreas? I don't know about that one. Trypsin? Well, maybe. He's kinda the big time player, right? Because he's responsible for all these proteases, these ones that go in there and kind of, you know, dissolve the proteins, but you got to think about that, is that when the pancreas gets all backed up for whatever reason, ne necrotic, is that these guys are going to start to turn, turn on itself, right? And then that's what's going to create the necrosis. So I like the idea of trypsin. Is it elastase? Well, elastase is just one of these guys. Chymotrypsin, well, he's just one of these guys. And then lipase, well, that's just for the lipids, okay? I could go, he's the lipids, amylase is for the carbs, these guys are for the protein. But who's the main player? Who's the biggest player of the bunch that can kind of create or get the, get the party started, per se, to break, down the, to break down the tissue? It's gonna be trypsin, okay? You gotta know the storyline, all right? Now, this one says, a. 39, it's the same question, it's 39 year old male, comes from the necrotic pancreas. Now, he undergoes surgical procedure for related frostbite, right? The guy was homeless, it was during the winter time. It's a very, very popular scenario on the exam, okay? So listen up real tight here. Patient undergoes surgical procedure for related frostbite and has two of his toes amputated on his right foot. On day five of admission, which is the second day post-op, he begins to demonstrate incoherent speech, confusion, and hallucinations. Which of the following is the likely cause of the patient's current state? All right, so what are you thinking? You, you, know, you have to make another inference here. Well, we knew that the guy was an alcoholic, right? But then what's also in play is he's post-op amputation. So is it A, opioid intoxication? Is it B, uh, liver impairment? Is it C, opioid withdrawal? Is it D, pain not being addressed properly? Or is, or is it E, uh, alcohol withdrawal? Well, you know, you, they want you to bite. I'll tell you this, and that's why I even, I even put this in choice A. They want you to, to bite on that his confusion, his incoherent speech would be indicative of like some type of intoxication or something to do with his surgery, you know? But at the end of the day, this guy was an alcoholic and now he's five days out He's having some type of complicated withdrawal. And when you throw in incoherent speech, confusion, hallucinations, this guy's going through the delirium tremens, okay? This guy's going through alcohol withdrawal. And they like to hide it behind some procedure, some medication, but at the end of the day, if you remember the guy's an alcoholic, he's now five days out, and Usually when you're like, say, 24, is out, 20, 24 hours from your last drink, you know, that's when you have the highest risk, uh, you know, I should say, you know, 12 to 24. But 12 to 24 hours is your highest risk for seizures after that it starts going down. But then when you get to day five, you know, day five through seven, you know, or as they say, even 48 hours to 96 hours, um, you're looking at the guy could go through uh, DTs. Okay, delirium, tremens. And that's when you're gonna get the disorientation, orientation, hallucinations, increase autonomic stability, hypertension, febrile, etc. And it's not like you have all of them, but it's more of a, you know, you're gonna see a lot of these symptoms. And we just had this like on our, uh, you know, kind of where I work, we had a guy Normal as could be, but when he hit day three, um, when he hit day three, then he just tanked like a stone um, and went through this. So be aware that they're going to probably, you know, kind of hide this kind of 
tied this into a second or third question down the line of someone who went through some procedure. But if you see, you know, if you see some guy, and again, we're making some inferences here. If he's homeless, uh, maybe they give you a lab value, an elevated uh, GGT, um, you know, MCV, folate deficiency, anything that leads to alcoholism. Be aware that this, that this question might be asked like that. This one says, a 53-year-old man presents with acute onset abdominal pain radiating to his back, nausea, and vomiting. Uh, CT scan suggests diagnosis of acute pancreatitis. The pathogenesis of acute pancreatitis relates to the inappropriate activation of trypsinogen to trypsin. Okay. Which of the following activates trypsin in normal digestion? Amylase, lipase, cholecystokinin, enterokinase, or phospholipase A2? Now, you should be jumping all over this one, but just to kind of review... We're in the pancreas, right? And we say that the pancreas is going to help us digest carbs, lipids, and proteins. Okay, and it's going to do that real quick. Carbs with amylase, lipids with lipase or phospholipase A2, okay? Or it's going to, it's going to allow proteins to be digested by the proteases. And this is where we're going to say it's the trypsinogen to uh, trypsin. It's the chymotrypsinogen to chymotrypsin. And it's the proelastase to elastase. elastase. And there's actually a pro, um, pro, procarboxypeptidase. Okay. Anyways, now, anyways, these are the proteases, right? But what activated this? Well, we said it's activation of brush border enzymes, which are what? Enterokinase, enteropeptidase. And what did they do? What did they do? They activated trypsinogen, which is inactive to trypsin, and that got the party started right there, okay? So who, which of the following activates trypsin in a normal digestion? Who activates trypsin? Enterokinase, okay? And they could throw this under like a, even a biochemistry kind of theme here. Um, but anyways, this is the GI system. What I would do, again, guys, if I were, if, is, is go back and just tell the story, you know, start like we did on that with the kids, going eating pancakes, going through the, the walk, you know, and then, you know, getting scared at the cave. Learn your dysphagias, right? You're starting in the mouth, and as you work your way down, you're gonna tell what tissues are in the esophagus and which ones get changed out when there's too much acid thrown on it. Then you're in the stomach, right? You're in the stomach, you're gonna take a piece of that and you're gonna say what cells are in the stomach, and then you got the proton pump, right? You're gonna, you can easily, you know, describe that. And then there's a couple things we're gonna talk about a little bit later. But then for right now in this video, we're at the, we're at the pancreas, and you're just gonna absolutely describe how the pancreas works and what are some of the key factors. And eventually, okay, eventually we're gonna make our way down and over around, etc. Um, but anyways, it's a good start, and hope this was helpful.